The Air Force's prototype YF-22 aircraft crashed April 25th at Edwards Air Force Base as the pilot was completing a practice approach over the runway. The investigation into the crash of the YF-22 tied it to the thrust vectors. They had been left on during the landing and contributed to the oscillation as the pilot moved that control stick. The crash was labeled a pilot error. The pilot himself rode off the crash and walked away from the airplane. F-22 Chief Test Pilot Paul Metz joined the F-22 program shortly afterwards. The problem was one of having a prototype flight control system uh, that was not designed to be used in that flight environment. Um, and uh, it had some sensitivity, some known sensitivity. And unfortunately, it caught uh, that particular pilot uh, on that particular day and, uh, and caused the resulting accident. The thrust vectors were integrated into the flight controls, eliminating the need to turn them on and off. Now, they automatically interpret the pilot's movements on the aircraft stick. The harder a pilot pulls on the stick, the more thrust vectoring the flight control system will provide. All of those commands from the pilot go through a computer, and the computer then manipulates or modulates those control surfaces depending on the flight conditions. Um, I, I like to think of the vector as simply being like a bigger aerodynamic tail on the airplane. They make the airplane move and pitch, uh, and uh, the pilot has no idea that part of that pitch is from the engines, part of the pitch or the horizontal tail. It's all transparent. While the crash was a setback for the F-22 program, the Air Force's interest in the fighter never diminished. My position for about 10 the impact. Operation Desert Storm in 1991 proved that a fighter with its capabilities was still needed. Uh, I think we expect what we saw in Desert Storm, that is, a clear, decisive, overwhelming show of force that ended the war very quickly with a minimal loss of life of our, of our people. In the future, we should expect that of all of our equipment. But the Gulf War raised the expectations of the American public for decisive conflicts of short duration. However, Desert Storm also reminded the F-22 designers of the need to be more flexible and ready to react to new problems, such as Iraq's Scud missile, for example. Many of our requirements were modified as a result of lessons learned in the Gulf War. Uh, hard to find relocatable launch targets, for example, uh, was one of the phenomena that, that was a, a fairly significant problem for the U.S. forces. Some of our systems on the airplane are designed to, to, to deal with that. The F-22 design team also had to react to rapid and ongoing changes in computer systems. In fact, one of the aircraft's newer features is flexibility for expansion and swapping out components. Capacity is available within the aircraft to add computer processor power. No hard mock-up of the plane was created. Instead, manufacturing plants in Fort Worth, Seattle, West Palm Beach, Florida, and East Hartford, Connecticut all relied on computer-generated models for such key components. At final assembly in Marietta, these major sections of the aircraft fit remarkably well. In fact, Lockheed Martin claims that some tolerances were accurate to within one six thousandth of an inch. The development that proved most difficult to cope was with the ongoing downsizing of the U.S. military. The shrinking defense dollar at times hurt the fighter's development. The Defense Secretary William Cohen warned Congress that it would have to close more bases to pay for all the weapon systems if desired, but Congress shied away from that painful task. Fearful of the political repercussions that left new weapon systems such as the F-22 vulnerable to the Pentagon Budget Acts. Against this backdrop of uncertain federal support, Lockheed Martin unveiled within fanfare its first F-22. On April 9, 1997, the company announced that this aircraft would take its first flight by the end of the following month. But that first F-22 stumbled badly out of the gate. One problem followed after another. 
and the program quickly fell three months behind. Finally, on September 7, 1997, Metz took the first F-22 into the air. That flight tested the aircraft's handling characteristics and engine performance through different power levels. It retracted the gear for a clean configuration to test handling, and it tested the aircraft in formation with an F-16. The roughly one-hour flight demonstrated the plane could fly. Lockheed Martin and the Air Force called the problems that delayed the first F-22 minor, although the repairs were sometimes complicated. But the delays gave critics ammunition. A military cost review agency twice warned that the F-22 was a risk of billion dollars cost overruns. Congress complained too many technical problems and too few test flights. Senators warned that this $187 million plane might be stuck dead if its price per copy kept climbing. The F-22 supporters responded by reminding Congress the fighter was far from a conventional aircraft. Thus, its cost and development were unpredictable. In my personal opinion, uh, this program has had an unprecedented focus on cost and cost control. Uh, we have been a co what's termed a cost reimbursable contract, principally because we're busting the, the frontiers of many new technologies on this program, and you can't very accurately predict where that's going to lead you as you bring these technologies online. If you look at this program in terms of its complexity from any historical measure, we believe we're going to deliver the airplane about 25% under what many outside experts think it should cost. So that's rather revolutionary in its own. Haunted by criticism, this team at Lockheed Martin in Georgia redoubled its efforts. They have succeeded in getting the second F-22 ready for its test flight, a full nine days ahead of schedule. But being ready is not the full measure of success, and the pressure for a perfect flight only increased. At 9 a.m., Everyone who works on the F-22 flight line, from engineers to stockroom clerks, stops what they are doing and heads out to the runway. We're doing a fire walk this morning, and fire is foreign object damage. Any item, a pebble, a rock, um, M any MSP item that might happen to be on the runway could damage the engine. And we are out here this morning to prevent that from happening. Flight walks are performed once or twice a week at fighter bases. But with this plane, FOD walks are done any time it is scheduled to have its engines running. The workers fan out and scan the pavement for anything that the vacuum truck may have missed. Something that small can nick an impeller blade and cause it to be off balance. If it's bad enough, it comes apart just like a hand grenade in flight. So we want to be very careful that we get everything off the ramp that we can see. At the end of the walk, all the workers' bags are carefully collected. There is no prize for the worker who turns into a bag with the most debris. A <laughs> FOD-free airplane, that's the prize, no busted engines. With the FOD walk completed, the ground crew begins at its last-minute check. Optimism runs high, but it's short-lived. Suddenly, there is a problem. A small hydraulic leak has been discovered. The pre-flight timetable is halted. For how long? No one knows. Two hours have gone by, but relief and optimism return. The hydraulic leak has been fixed. Test pilot Paul Metz arrives. He greets Bayer, the crew chief, and the two duo walk around inspection of the fighter. The boom on the F-22's nose reflects the test phase of this aircraft. The antenna sprouting from it will send data streaming back to the small white building. This is the nerve center for the test flight. The building is full of engineers who monitor every system on the F-22 while it's in flight. The ground crew conducts another FOD walk. It's now 11 a.m. and an anxious crowd of Lockheed employees and curious reporters have gathered to watch this F-22 make its first leap skyward. Metz climbs into the cockpit. 
Buyer assists him in buckling up. Starting an F-22 is almost as easy as starting an antique car. Early designs required the pilot to complete 17 steps. But for all its complexity, this F-22 asked him to do just three things. Turn the battery on, push the auxiliary power, switch to start, and move both throttles to idle. The airplane's actually very simple to operate. It only takes a few switches to get it started. And once we get it started, we have to go through a number of checks with the airplane to get it ready for flight. Byers signals to Metz to bring up the power. Metz talks to both the tower and the control room. Running through more checklists on the ground, Byer, the crew chief, listens in and paces some more. Now, the plane is ready for its initial move or roll check. Metz eases the jet half roll forward and taps the brakes. Bayer now begins signaling to Metz to head toward the runway. As he rolls out, Metz is engaged in a constant conversation with the control room, running checks for all his systems. He also talks to the pilot of the F-16 chase plane to coordinate takeoff and rendezvous. Metz taxis forward toward the runway, testing his rudder, closing down his engine nozzles. He stops again for what is called the last chance inspection. Bayer gives him a thumbs up and hands them over to the tower. The aircraft rolls to the head of the runway and prepares for takeoff. It is now 11.30 a.m. The chase plane heads out. The F-16 will be Met's eyes outside of the plane, looking for problems visually verifying all aspects of the test flight. Now, the moment has come. All the months of effort boiled down to a single motion of the left hand. Metz eases the throttle forward and adds power to the engines. A few breathless seconds later, Raptor 2 takes flight. Immediately, the newly born plane physically and visibly gives notice of its sheer power. The nose lifts higher as it surges into a gravity-mocking climb. It's an initial performance that, Metz later will admit, even surprised him. The F-16 must go to afterburner to keep up. This is a real high point of the airplane. Pratt & Whitney's done a fantastic job with the, the engines. They operate very, very smoothly with almost no vibration. You can tell no difference between idle and military power. For all its excitement, the takeoff was not the culmination of today's effort. It was merely a beginning. There is a flight plan to be followed and tests to be done. According to that flight plan, Metz will fly a triangular route over Georgia. He will head north to Jasper, 40 miles away. Then turn west for a 46-mile leg, then turn south and return to Dobbins and Marietta. After the initial climb, the F-22 slows to 200 knots and levels off. The gear stays down for the first test phase. While he cruises, Metz and the engineers run through checks of the aircraft systems, making sure all are working. Once everyone is convinced the plane is functioning correctly, it is time to check flight control systems. Time to make the Raptor move a little. The ailerons, the rudders, the thrust factors. As something moves, data goes streaming back to the white control building. Here we're seeing some control motions with the rudder. Again, just uh, relatively gentle maneuvers to see if the airplane responds just as was predicted in the simulations. And it did. Now Metz brings the throttle forward again. The added power pushes the aircraft to 225 knots, and quickly, the two climb to 20,000 feet. Now comes a critical step. The landing gear is tested. It retracts smoothly and is lowered again. Then, raised for good. 
putting the gear up represents an act of faith that it'll come back down. The first phase of the test flight is complete. It has not only gone smoothly, it has been perfect. Bring the gear up and take a look at the characteristics of the airplane and what we call a clean configuration. Landing gear comes up and once it does, the airplane is very, very smooth. There's absolutely no buffet and uh, characteristics are excellent. Everything done with the gear down is now repeated. Checking how the F-22 handles, how the engines respond, Again, with the gear up, we'll look at some of those relatively mild handling qualities characteristics, such as bank-to-bank -bank rolls and some of the control inputs. And again, the airplane is it's very quick, very cat-like and agile in the response. 40 minutes into flight, another milestone test. METS and the F-16 show the F-22's ability to fly in formation. And we use the cameraman as a director in this case to help me make rel relatively rapid and quick changes in position while flying the wing of the F-16 here. Finally, nearly an hour later, the test flights are over. There's just one thing left to do. Coming in close to final, the airplane uh, floats very nicely, can be flared and touches down very softly. As they land, Metz holds up Raptor's nose to help slow the plane. Once on the ground, we hold the nose up for aero braking to bleed off some airspeed. I deployed the speed brakes just as the nose came down for touchdown. And that also helps dissipate the airspeed. With about 5,000 feet of runway remaining, brakes are applied, bringing the F-22 down to a fairly slow speed to finish the rollout. Handling characteristics in the landing phase are, are really delight. Uh, it'll make any pilot feel proud to bring the airplane back and land it. It's a very easy airplane to land. As the spectators applaud, Metz brings forward the F-22 over towards them and lets the plane take a bow. These are the folks that are really responsible for getting me in the air. And there are thousands of people, not only uh, in Marietta, but Seattle, Fort Worth, Pratt & Whitney, uh, and the suppliers around the United States, and in fact, around the world, that uh, struggled for a long time to put this airplane together. Back at the ramp, the ground crew cheers. Metz leaves the cockpit, there are handshakes and photos all around for a successful test flight. It was by the book. The uh, flight profile was flown exactly as we had planned it out and um, absolutely no anomalies on the airplane. It's uh, ready to go again. Don't have a squawk on either the instrumentation or the airframe itself. Anything unexpected, either good or bad? Well, you probably saw it on the climb out here. Uh, we rotated up to the climb at about three-fourths field and uh, really rocketed on up there. And both I, myself and the chase pilot both remarked that that was a lot spiffier performance than we saw with number one. And I, I can't explain it because it's a hotter day, but it really, it really went upstairs today. With the plane safely back on the ramp, Bayer can finally stop pacing. Well, I guess a lot of things go through your mind. I mean, you think about fuel, you think about electrical power, but mainly is a uh, great feeling jumping off and um, made a few bets with the ground crew of how bad the airborne pickup would be. But he, Colonel uh, Rainey hit it pretty good. He was right with him. <laughs> oh, okay. Elation is pervasive among the ground crew. Fantastic. Got this airplane in the air early. Got it back. No squawks on it. Perfect. This successful test flight does much today to chase away the program's demons. The F-22 team has proven it can deliver a test flight early and with flawless results. That should go far in helping others focus on what is really the aircraft's key selling points. Its maneuverability and speed, according to METS. The most striking thing that you see when you get in it is the, is the raw power. 
and that's what's going to uh, be an eye-opener to the operational pilot. With its flawless test flight behind it, this F-22 will stick to its schedule and fly again in two days. After that, it will undergo some minor modifications, then be test flown about a half dozen more times. If those go well, the aircraft will then be ferried to Edwards Air Force Base in California. What will join the first F-22 in future test flights? The naysayers in Congress, meanwhile, will be forced to consider that this plane made its test flight nine days early without a single hitch and demonstrated some exciting fighter capabilities. I think the reliability we're seeing and our ability to hold to schedule with this complex system are both very strong testimony to the fact that the program's coming together. Bayer agrees. Well, I think it proves the Congress and the United States Air Force that Lockheed Martin can build a reliable fighter on time and, and below budget. Uh, the crews come together and they, they know what they're doing and we worked through some uh, trying times on the first aircraft, and but we learned and that's the biggest thing it showed. We learned from the difficulties we had and we've overcome them and now we're a month ahead of schedule. Now, Bayer is ready to announce the last step today for the crew. It's not more testing or more analysis or even reviews although those will surely go on as well. Well, I think everybody's going out tonight and uh, unwind a little bit, have a good time. So uh, we'll enjoy ourselves. <laughs>